Hi friends, welcome to JCT TV. This is Bible teaching for the 21st century. You know, sooner or later when you read the Bible and or when you encounter Jesus, whether in other books and or in conversation with people who are believers in Jesus, you reach the point of acceptance or rejection. Um, I'll comment on this, why it's important to accept Jesus, but the acceptance rejection dynamic is unavoidable. You cannot study Jesus and remain neutral. We'll get to that right after this. Cantillon's Casual Commentary, a companion guide as you study the Gospel of Matthew along with your host, Jim Cantillon. There is so much in Scripture that can't be covered in a half-hour program. What is the context for this story? What were the Jewish traditions at the time? What is the Hebrew meaning of the word? Jim decided to share some of his research with you in a series of compact booklets that soon will be a book. We'd like you to have a copy of Cantillon's Casual Commentary, edition number one. Place your order with a meaningful gift and help us build this ministry. You may wish to become a monthly partner when you place your order. Phone 519-415-8341 or write Jim Cantillon today, Post Office Box 989, Burlington, Ontario, L7R3Y7 or go to jimcantillontoday.com. Ask for Cantillon's Casual Commentary and state the amount of your gift. We're in Matthew 11, friends, and we're picking up in verse 20. Then he, Jesus, began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works that were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it should be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Once again, Jesus uses hyperbole, he, he, uh, which is exaggeration for the sake of emphasis. But he's making a very powerful and a profound point here. Basically, he is... warning uh, the people of his day, and by extension, us who read today, that um, if we reject him, we are facing serious consequences. There's no specific charge here. You know, he mentions these cities, uh, Tyre, or I should say uh, Chorazin, Bethsaida, Capernaum. But the implication is that cities, in general, numb our awareness of our ultimate dependence, not on commerce, but on the provision that a loving Heavenly Father gives freely to all people. I know there's this urban-rural discussion, if not debate, that has prevailed throughout the centuries. Uh, people say to this day, if you really want to get in touch with God, get in touch with nature. I think there's something to it. You get out into a forest of mighty redwoods on the southern or on the um, eastern coast, the western coast, pardon me, of California and Oregon, as I have done, and I mean it's like a cathedral. You walk in there with trees that are three and four hundred feet tall and they're about twenty feet in diameter, in diameter, and you say, "Whoa!" And it's totally silent. You can hear a pin drop. You're standing, you know, on the deadfall of uh, hundreds of years of uh, life. It's absolutely inspiring. You, you, or you look at a mountain vista, or you dip your feet in a crystal clear, cold, icy mountain stream. Uh, you, you've never felt more alive in your life, and you have a sense of the holy, a sense of the profound genius of creation. 
Um, you go into the cities and it's concrete and smoke and noise and rush and tension. Just the other day, my barber said, I, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to the country. I'm just fed up with people being angry all the time. Good point. I think the implication is that cities can be detrimental to our spiritual health. Okay. And I'm not suggesting for a minute we all leave the cities. No. Now, we know nothing of Chorazin, although I have a friend who lives in modern Chorazin. It's a small settlement of modern houses on the northern slopes above the Sea of Galilee. In fact, I used to uh, rent uh, a flat from him that he owned in Jerusalem. But Seda, I was in just a few months ago, uh, uh, recording the In His Footsteps series for our Daily Bread Day Discovery television show in Canada. But Seda is built of uh, bas um, um, basalt rock, which means black volcanic rock. Uh, it's not really much mentioned in scripture, but it was a place where a blind man was healed. Capernaum, of course, Kfar Nahum, was Jesus' adopted hometown, and he probably bunked in at uh, Peter's house, which is right there almost on the shore of the lake. But what the general state of urban culture was, was secular. It was something that mitigated, if you will, uh, the spiritual sensitivity that being in touch with the world of nature brought. Now, in Jesus' case, he was both urban and rural. And as we read his story, we see him spending just as much time in the wilderness and in the mountains and, you know, in the countryside as he did in the cities. But nevertheless, he's saying, you guys, for whatever reason, are in trouble because essentially what you've done is you've rejected my message. As I say, he healed a blind man in Bethsaida. He did any number of healing miracles in Capernaum. They basically reject him. The warning is that we should not reject them. You know, Billy Graham used to uh, call his radio show The Hour of Decision. And in his um, evangelistic services, he would call people to make a decision for Christ. Sooner or later, friends, you got to decide. If you hear about Jesus, you read about Jesus, you're responsible for what you've heard. You're responsible for what you've read. You can't just approach him neutrally. You can't say, oh, he's just one of those great men, you know, along with many others who, you know, represented the religious traditions or founded religious traditions, and we respect him for that. But uh, he has nothing to say to me specifically, and he certainly does not hold the words of life and death. The Bible says he does. Jesus said he does. He who has seen me has seen the Father, Jesus said. You accept him or you reject him. That's just the way it is. Let's move on. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Here Jesus claims unique sonship to God the Father. He claims a kind of exclusive knowledge in verse 27. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. I have exclusive knowledge of the Father, but, Jesus is saying, I will share it with you. I was asking someone recently when they pray, you know, when they're praying, are they thinking about God the Father, are they thinking about God the Son, that being Jesus? And uh, this person responded, I, I, I really sort of think about Jesus. He says, who do you think about? I said, well, I think about the Father, but, you know, he who's seen the Father, seen the Son, he's seen the Son, has seen the Father, one and the same. The mystery of the Trinity, all right? But what he's saying is, I'm not just a spiritual leader. I am 
the very presence of God itself. You can enter into relationship with me, he's saying. Which is profound. I mean, it boggles the mind, frankly. The last study I read by the astronomers and the scientific world who specialize in things like the Hubble telescope and other means with radio telescopes of searching the heavenlies, that their latest estimate is that in the universe itself there are maybe 14 trillion galaxies. That would be 14 trillion galaxies. Each galaxy with billions of heavenly bodies in them. I mean, I can't get my mind around that. I just can't even begin to comprehend it. Jesus is claiming to be the son of the God who made all of this. In fact, John will tell us that Jesus was the creative agent. In the beginning was the word, the word is, the word is capital W, referring to Jesus, the Logos. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him is life and the life is the son of man. You got to start with awe. You have to admit that you're blind. I mean, relative to what's out there and to what's being revealed in the scripture, we're more blind than seeing. We got to admit there's far more about God we don't know than what we do know, which should uh, mitigate any attempt on our part to be know-it-all or to be condescending or arrogant in a representation of faith to those who have no faith at this point. And Jesus gives us a good example here. He says, I thank thee, Father. Our relationship with him should reflect the relationship with Father inside. It should be one of gratitude. My attitude isn't an arrogant one where I think that I know it all or I, you know, I'm on the inside track. No, my approach is one of humble gratitude. I am so grateful. Especially heartfelt in this context after reading about the denouncing of these lukewarm cities. Our gratitude for God should be red hot. I think if there's one thing God is looking for in you and me, it's gratitude. Thankfulness. I try to do it every morning. I start my day with gratitude. And I'm not bragging when I say it. I'm just saying that's something I must do. Because I had this profound sense that there's one thing the Lord wants from us. It's our love and it's our gratitude. You read the Old Testament. What was his knock against Israel? Time and time and time and time and time again. As you read the various uh, prophetic utterances in Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, or the 12 minor prophets like Hosea and Habakkuk and Amos and others. You've forgotten me, Israel. I'm the one that brought you out of Egypt. I'm the one that brought you through 40 years in the wilderness. I'm the one that parted the Red Sea. I'm the one. I'm the one. And yet you want to go after other gods? You want to serve, it, serve that horrid god Moloch who requires your firstborn, throwing him into, my, in, into his big mouth full of fire? And you, you, want, you want that instead of a god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Ingratitude leads to all kinds of things, including forgetfulness. So let's follow Jesus' example and say, I thank you, Father, and let those words be the start of every day. I thank you, Father. One, two, three, four words. And take it from there. Let the Lord know you've not forgotten him. Point made. Let's move on. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly, lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, when I hear strident preachers or just everyday strident believers who, without even knowing it, are on their high horse and are talking down 
from their heights. Making us feel lesser than the uh, unwashed, the, uh, the dull and the broken compared to the brilliance of their spiritual knowledge. I remember Jesus' words here. I am gentle or meek and lowly in heart. Even though I condescended, even though I emptied myself, became like you are, I don't rub it in your face. I do not even talk about it. I was laid in a manger, the trough where animals feed, as my cradle. I was wrapped in swaddling clothes, strips of cloth. For most of my adult life ministry, I had no place permanent to live. Foxes of holds, birds of the air have nests, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I did not come to you in kingly clothing. I came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, not a white charger. I allowed people to beat me without saying a word. This is the Jesus we're talking about here. I died so that you might live. I took your sin upon me so that you would not have to die spiritually. I've done it all for you because I love you. So, are you laboring and heavy laden today? Are you without rest today? Is your life full of stress and anxiety? Take my yoke upon you, Jesus said, and learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart. You can be gentle and lowly heart too. And you're going to find rest for your souls. You say, how do I find rest? You commit yourself to Jesus. You say, well, whoa, 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 what does that mean? Jesus simply says, come unto me. Okay, Jesus, I'm coming to you now, wherever you are. I believe you're there. Here I am. Remember me, I'm Jim boy, I need rest. My life is stressed. My life is broken. I feel I've failed. I feel like I have no peace. Jesus says, let me be your peace. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I'm not going to lay a heavy religious weight on your shoulder. But I'm going to come alongside. I'm going to comfort you. In fact, I'm going to indwell you by my Holy Spirit, which is a supernatural indwelling. I can't explain that one, but it happens. And you begin to discover, as the scripture says in another place, peace that passes understanding. Peace that by all accounts shouldn't be there. What is there, because Jesus is there. Into my heart, into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. We used to sing in Sunday school. Beautiful little song, genius. Invite him in, do it now. Very few African mothers ever see a doctor or midwife, yet each mother knows how fragile her child's life is. You see, 26,000 children under the age of five will die today because they don't have access to medical care. Your gift of $260, just $22 every month, helps stock a mobile clinic and train healthcare workers to care for young mothers and their children during pregnancy and preschool years. Join WOW Mother Care now. Protect the life of a mother and her child. The work of the Word of God is stunningly remarkable. We must understand that God has placed His life codes of salvation and healing in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Jim Canalon is focused on the messages that God has communicated through the Bible to you. If you have heard the divine mind speak to you through this program, then God has worked in an amazing way to reveal His Word. Remember that this program has cost and we've been faithful to bring God's Word to you. If you desire to give an offering in any amount, we would appreciate it. Write to us at Jim Candelon Today, P.O. Box 989, Burlington, Ontario, L7R3Y7. Or call us at 519-415-8341. Or simply visit jimcantillontoday.com.
Let me just um, add to what I said a moment ago and, and walk through uh, verse 28 to 30 of Matthew 11. I'll read it again. Come to me, all you who, who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. Rest is mentioned twice here. Uh, you read the book of uh, Hebrews, and there's reference there on more than one occasion to entering into God's rest. And at, in that context, it referred to the promised land. After 400 years of slavery in Egypt and then 40 years of wandering through the wilderness, they needed rest big time. And rest was um, uh, characterized as the promised land. You enter into the promised land, that's God's rest He's provided for you. You no longer will be resident in a land where you're a slave. You no longer be itinerant in a wilderness that is harsh and uh, unforgiving. You will now have a place where you can put down roots, you'll be able to plant crops, you'll be able to raise families, uh, have animals, uh, uh, enjoy yourself, have fun, uh, have some shade from your own fig tree and the fruit from it, you know, all that kind of stuff. Rest, rest, rest. Rest for your souls uh, is rest on a different level. You, you can have all of the trappings of rest in terms of material things and be very restless. Not in the sense of curious about what's out there, but restless in the sense that you're not resting. Um, I'm sure you've read biopics of uh, uh, very successful people who have all of this world's goods who are very unhappy and deeply uh, restless, uh, whose lives are consumed by uh, uppers and downers, drugs to make them sleep, drugs, drugs to wake them up, drugs not just to banish pain, but drugs basically just to dull the reality of life. And yet they've got everything. Rest for your souls is something that is more valuable than anything on this planet. You can have all the money in the world, and if you don't have rest in your soul, in fact, the scripture will say, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? We're talking about peace deep within. And here Jesus is promising it to heavily laden souls. Come unto me, you who labor, heavily laden, and I will give you rest. He proposes a, a transfer of yokes his easy yoke for the heavy yoke of the, of the law as the religious culture of his day required. Um, he says, look, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. I've not come here to oppress you with religious do's and don'ts. I'm not here to scold you or to make you feel guilty about your lack of rest. I'm here just simply to offer you rest and to give you some lightness of being. Now there is a, a tradition, and I think those who hold to it may be onto something, that Jesus may have been a yoke maker. Now his father, Joseph, was in construction as we know. He was a carpenter. He also probably worked with stone. He may have been a mason as well. He may have been involved in a lot of construction projects in and around Nazareth uh, as the Romans were building their own kingdom in that area. But if Jesus was indeed, among other skills, a yoke maker, he would understand heavy and light. He would understand productive and unproductive design. A yoke is meant for two oxen, and it's got to be custom designed. So it fits in such a way that it will not chafe their shoulders and cause them pain as they you know, pull the plow or pull the wagon, whatever it is that the yoke is attached to. My yoke is easy, meaning you are my yoke. It's designed just for you. And you'll have no wear points. You'll have no sore points. It will work beautifully. I know that we can overdo it in terms of 
talking about a personal relationship with God. We can so personalize the relationship with God that we make him into a personal deity, which he's not. But there is something we said for the fact that he responds to us as persons and knows our name even before we're born. He, he knows where we're coming from. He knows what our needs are. He knows what our needs will be. And he works with us according to that. He makes our yoke easy and our burden light. And these words from Jesus here turn from his awareness of intimate knowledge of God the Father to his compassion for the spiritually oppressed. He offers rest from the burden of sin, relief from the yoke of bondage. And his only command, his only requirement, please love God and love your neighbor. Be righteous, be just, full stop. Everything else is housekeeping. Remote and rural, these children and their families have no access to medical care. There is no clinic nearby. And when a mother is desperate to save her dying child, she will walk for many hours. Sometimes the child doesn't survive. So we go to them. These tables and chairs under the trees look like a gathering, not a medical clinic. But the doctors and nurses are transforming the lives of the children and their families. They provide primary medical care, classes on sanitation, medicines, and a better understanding of HIV and AIDS. Most of all, they bring hope as they diagnose, treat, and educate families. This clinic is a gift from donors that will transform their lives. You can become part of that transformation. Your gift of $25 will provide health care for an entire family. $100 provides care for six families. Be a part of real change. Go to wowmission.ca slash save a child. You know, it's time to cast away the old yoke and take on the new yoke. The light and easy yoke of Jesus. It's a reality for millions of people around the world this very day. And if it's not your reality, it can be. How do you begin? Jesus said, pray this way, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Start there, the lowest point, and he will lift you up. Thanks for watching, I'm Jim Candle and bye for now. Contact us, Jim Catalan today, P.O. Box 989, Burlington, Ontario, L7R 3Y7. If you're sending a check, make it payable to Jim Cantillon today. Or visit us online at jimcantillontoday.com and click support. <laughs> <laughs>